Hey everybody, it's Matt. And Mike. Iron Trap Garage, and uh, we don't have anything interesting to shoot, so we're gonna give you guys a BS video today. That's because we're headed on a trip in like, no time. Tomorrow. Yeah, so uh, basically, it's actually a good time to have a, do this video. We, we get a lot of questions from people that maybe haven't been watching the channel from like day one. Um, so there's a bunch of questions that get asked like all the time, and uh, we figured we'd do like the top five most frequently asked questions about Iron Trap Garage. And hopefully we can answer some of these questions right here in the video. And if this is fun, maybe we can do more of these. So, number one, probably the most asked question. Especially recently, there's been yeah. a lot, a lot of questions. What the hell is this building? Why does it look so awesome or funny? Are, are you in the back cave? What, the, what, what is it? So, uh, it is sort of like my little back cave, uh, but the building was basically uh, was an airplane hangar originally. It was built in 1947. There's actually a cornerstone outside that, um, that says 1947 on it. And it was a airplane hangar. And I bought it from basically like the second family, I believe. And they put normal garage doors on the front. But there used to be like curtain style doors that would kind of slide around. And there's remnants of the track in the ceiling and also in the concrete floor where it used to go around. And there was basically like a crop duster type plane. Uh, this property, was uh, the house was built in 1930 and, and this house used to own all kinds of land around here and now it's kind of like built up around us a little bit and there used to be like orchards and a dirt airstrip so there used to be a plane in here and uh, i had heard some rumors about that but i really knew it was true uh once we had some old timers come by or guys that have lived here for a really long time came by and said like oh i used to race my mini bike on the dirt drag racer mini bike on the tr on the uh, on the airstrip, or I used to see a plane hanging in here. And like most recently, we had a couple guys came by that, that have lived in this town their whole life or grew up here, and they told us the building was actually like falling down when they were kids in like oh, the really? 60s. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, Stainless Stan and his brother came by, and uh, they were giving me some background on it, and they hmm. said that the building when they were kids, they used to come in here and play because it was draw. It was like big open paved space and they could ride their bikes around and do whatever. And he said that actually the roof of things was, was kind of in rough shape at that point in like the, maybe the early sixties or something like that, hmm. uh, earlier mid sixties maybe. So, uh, but yeah, the building was, a, was an airplane hangar. There's these massive beams that they built into the building uh, that are like the size of like, you know, Golden Gate Bridge or so Ben Franklin. I think the biggest beam, I think the web, so like from flange to flange is like 30 inches. To put that in perspective, it's huge. It's, it's absolutely it's massive. ridiculous. So because of that, that's one of the main things that I walked in here, I'm like, yeah, we need a chain hoist. So that's why we have, on this side, I have a little dolly or trolley and a chain hoist and we've lifted like, when I got my big eight foot cast iron brake, we lifted it off the car trailer with the chain hoist and slid the whole thing across and dropped it where it's Actually, at. the beams are so big, we couldn't find a trolley to yeah. fit on the beam. We had to make our own bolt to hold everything together because there was nothing wide enough on the market. That wasn't like $5,000. Yeah, so, but yeah, so the building was that, um, it's the back wall is actually like built into the ground. So when you go to the back side of the building, like this back corner, it's literally like knee height off of the ground and it's got a flat roof. So you could step on the, on the roof, walk out there and do whatever you want to do. I want to put a building on top of the building, which would be really awesome. Uh, but basically that back wall, it's kind of built like a bank barn, but it was never a bank barn. It's always been like an airplane hangar. And the family that I bought it from at one point, I think they fixed the building up a little bit to start putting some of the family like cars in it. Like they, I think there was some muscle cars that one of the family members used to keep in here. So they made it really nice. And then when I bought it, obviously, I just made it all go to hell. And it looks like it's been a... Made it. Now, there was three light bulbs in this entire garage when Matt moved in. Yeah, it was crazy. When I moved When I moved in here, I'm like, there's so much space. I'll never fill this up. And I put, like, the meat truck in it. And I'm like, man, this, this is amazing. And now I'm, like, in Three years it. later. And, uh, it's been four, right? I think it's been four. Maybe four. I don't remember. Anyway, it's yeah. full. Yeah, it's completely full. So uh, that's what the building was. Uh, the, the concrete floor was like perfectly white and clean when we moved in here. And now it is like not at all. There's a lot of uh, oil stains. A lot of oil stains. So, uh, but yeah, it's been really awesome that the, you know, the building uh, has the age to it. So it really matches the, the cars. And that's what I was shopping for when I was looking for a, a house and a garage. And uh, the only downside to this building is, is number one, um, 
it's hard to heat because of like all the stone walls when it's really really cold outside it's hard to get heat to like absorb into that where the cold kind of comes through um, that's that's probably the biggest the biggest problem in here and the building sheds it's stone so it's constantly like just falling off it's like being in a cave it's just like dirt and things fall off all the time so this will never be a nice clean perfect no. Garage. It's perfectly shitty. Perfectly shitty, just like me and everything I own. So that is our number one most frequently asked question about Iron Trap Garage. <laughs> All right, so the number two question is, uh, do you guys do this full time? Which is kind of a yes and no answer. Yeah, so if you're, if you're judging by hours, yeah, we do it's this full time. time. <laughs> it's full time hours, but we both have like day jobs. So I've worked for the Eastwood company for 10, 11 years now. And uh, I was been doing the video thing and marketing and influencer marketing, all the stuff, social media there for 10 or 11 years. And um, I still work there, I still do that. And uh, it's kind of fun because both of these these interests and job kind of flow together and allows me to show off some of the personal projects, but also use some of the tools and, and, and allow that to work for Eastwood as well. So I, I'm actually a industrial electrician at a chocolate company. Uh, I've been doing that for, I've been an electrician for like 10 plus years, but I've been there for five. And uh, thankfully the schedule that I work lends a lot of free time to deal with the shenanigans of the YouTube channel. So uh, it's kind of nice having that schedule because it lends free time to be spent here and editing and that kind of stuff and shipping packages and yeah. So it's a full-time job basically, yes. Yeah, we, we, both, we both joke that we have like two or three full-time jobs. Like for me, I have the Eastwood, I have this. I also buy and sell parts, which helps fund all of my hobby and my nonsense. So that's like a third job of just like listing parts and hunting for them and all that stuff so it's kind of crazy and then mike also is you know you're doing the buying and selling yeah buying and selling not as much but i also have to deal with matt so that's like a full <laughs> job. being his uh assistant we'll, we'll say and then shipping i do all the merch handling so there's a lot involved with that and then of course editing all the videos and all of that stuff replying to youtube comments which yeah. is like that's a fourth job youtube comments can yeah, be that's... A lot. a lot but we try and we still try and i've said it since the beginning we try and answer or definitely read like every comment on all forms of social media and we try to respond to most of them um, i give myself we joke i give myself like one maybe two snarky response to people that are that are trolls on our on videos and social media but generally we kind of have thick skin but every now and then we got to fire a shot back but yep. it's uh it that's a whole nother portion and a lot of what we do is done in the wee hours of the morning and you know late nights stuff like very that. very late nights yes so that is our number two most frequently asked questions about iron trap garage all right so number three uh most asked question is how do we learn to do all of this and this is kind of like a broad thing because we do a lot of different stuff so like how do i learn how to do metalworking tig welding you know all that stuff that you see in the shop how did i learn how to do uh, you know, finding parts and my people are often amazed by my memory or knowledge of some of these obscure old parts. And then of course, Mike gets asked all the time, you know, video and editing and all of that stuff. So for me, for the metalworking um, and, and the TIG welding, basically everything that I do, I learn just by doing and practicing, reading books, reading magazines, reading online. I did take a couple of small uh, like weekend classes on, on, on metal fab and uh, metal shaping. Um, but a lot of it was just from watching, you know, going to help guys in the area that are much higher level than me and, and helping them out for free and doing different stuff like that. I learned a lot of that. TIG welding, I literally, like the way I learned TIG welding is, uh, Eastwood came out with a TIG welder when I was like early on in my time at Eastwood. I literally sat down for one year, every single lunch break and practiced TIG welding every day at lunch and after a year of doing that, I was able to like actually weld something on a project vehicle or I felt confident to do that. Now fast forward a number of years and I'm, I'm pretty uh, competent in TIG welding, which uh, it, it's one of those things that all this stuff is, as far as metalworking and welding goes, it's all like practice. So like I don't TIG weld as often as I used to just because we're doing so much other stuff. So like sometimes I got to do like a warm up for like a couple hours to get warmed up on TIG welding. But so all that stuff for me is just from reading and learning and, and, and just spending the time on my own in my free time to kind of get those skills up and I'm, I'm still learning every day. 
I mean, even, even editing is almost basically the same thing. You know, I started with a little bit of knowledge on how to edit <clears throat> in our early days. And basically it's from, surprisingly enough, watching YouTube, watching other YouTube channels with a larger following that has better quality stuff and watching how to's and I mean, literally just the channel. We do three videos a week for 52 weeks a year. It's 156 videos a year and we're on year number three. So it's a lot of videos to practice on. Yeah, so, and you, and you know, so you did, Mike did a little bit of a channel. Before. Yeah, I had a small YouTube channel doing like four wheel repair and that kind of stuff. And I did all my editing myself. I kind of learned in high school a little bit. So I had, I had enough to get us by to start the channel and get it to where it is now, obviously. But a lot of it was just learned from watching more content, watching how to's, you know, I see a cool transition. Oh, let me Google how to do that real quick. Spend an hour on YouTube figuring out how to do it and sending it to Matt. And he says, that was stupid. Yeah. Spend another hour finding something else to do. So it's just literally practice. It's basically with everything like this. It's just practice, practice, practice. And, and me with work doing the Eastwood thing for 10, 11 years and kind of working in the industry, both with Eastwood and just being around some other stuff that's higher end uh, with TV shows and stuff that I've worked with, like, I've gotten the eye for some of the shots that are like a higher level. Yep. So even though we're still like on a grassroots, low, yeah, we're still grassroots. We try and get some of that uh, kind of fancy shooting and yeah. cinematic like shots that I think add a lot to our videos. So we get asked the, the editing and filming thing a lot by people that are looking to start their own channel and just watch like higher end content and you can learn some, you know, transitions and some and there's, shots. And there's some really high end filmmakers that have a YouTube channel that is literally dedicated to how to's mm -hmm. and teaching people that are new to the industry or the hobby on how to do this kind of stuff. So there's, there's a plethora of information out there. It's just taking the, it takes a lot of time to sit down and learn it and understand it and then remember how to do it efficiently yep. when you need to do it again. Yep. But that's, that's basically it. There's no magic answer here. It's just practicing and learning. And it's like and a, a little kid practice, practice, practice. That's right. Number four. Yeah, so number four we kind of get asked a lot is like, how did we get started? I mean, Matt and I have been friends for close to 10 years, I want to say. Seven, eight, nine, ten. And Matt's been doing this stuff for... My whole life. I've bas been, basically his whole life. I've, I've been doing crazy crap my whole life. And um, I mean, literally since... 18? Since I was like the day I was 18, I got kicked out of my house and was on my own. And like, I used to do the, the like skateboarding and BMX thing when I was like high school and just out of high school. And I used to literally do the same stuff. I would hop in a car and just drive somewhere. And the only difference was we weren't junk. We weren't like picking around in junkyards. We were riding like skateboard ramps, sleeping on people's couches and all that stuff. So I've always been doing the traveling thing. And then I slowly transitioned into doing car stuff. And for a while, when I was a little younger, I used to do a lot of like vintage European cars. And um, I used to go to Europe quite often doing the same crap, jumping around junkyards. It's a little bit crazier though. Yeah. Some of the stories that Matt has told me over the years, it's like, why were we doing YouTube 15 years ago yeah. when it first started? We would be like, it's be insane right now. Yeah, so I've, I've been kind of doing this stuff my whole life. I mean, I was a little kid, you know, digging around in barns doing this stuff. I've always been fascinated by it. So it kind of was like a natural progression. Um, with doing the Eastwood stuff for so long, like obviously Eastwood is a bigger business, so they're trying to sell products and sell tools. So there was a lot of videos that we shot that were like, they allowed me to give the freedom, like doing the go to city coupe, doing the chassis and so that stuff, which was really awesome that I got to like showcase that. But because we're trying to keep it streamlined and sell tools, I couldn't tell all the neat stories or the background or all that stuff in those videos because we're really trying to teach you how to build a chassis, not tell you all the background of how I found the body and all the deep stuff. So that's how the channel, like I wanted an outlet for doing that and I was kind of doing it on social media, on my personal social media, but when I bought the property and moved into the shop, Mike came over to help me wire the shop and everything. Well, I've been, I was hounding him for a while before that. Like we should, cause I've helped Matt drag cars out of many sketchy places and <laughs> help him vend at flea markets. And like, we should start a YouTube channel. Cause I had my little channel at that time. And I was like, it's, I'm doing decent. I wasn't doing anything groundbreaking. Like the stuff that you're doing is absolutely insane. We need to do something with it. And then the first time I was actually here the day you made settlement. Yeah. You were pulling a, a ranchero, quote unquote. Custom ranchero yeah. that I bought it at an auction. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I helped you drag home. The number one thing my real estate uh, agent said is don't make any large purchases during the month of closing. So what do I do? Go to an auction and I bought a bunch of old parts. Good thing and you I, didn't buy the 32 that he had. 
Yeah, there was actually, yeah, there was a 32.3 window that I still kicked myself for not buying. It was like pretty cheap and I couldn't buy it. And I was like, uh, so I bought a Ranchero for like, I don't know, a thousand bucks or something. It was stupid. Yeah. It was very stupid. But he, he, he reprimanded me, but we still luckily got through closing. So the day I was here on closing, I was like, dude, this is, this is perfect. I mean, we need to redo the electric because there's three light bulbs in this entire <laughs> garage, but we should start a YouTube channel. Like this is perfect. You can't ask, you can't recreate this in Hollywood or anywhere. It's yeah. literally the perfect backdrop. So this is one of those things where you, you know, it all kind of came together. I'm a big believer in that, that like not forcing things. So I knew I wanted a building that looked cool and to put old cars in just for personal reasons. Cause I like that aesthetic and, and the, the old school feel to it. But you know, that, that kind of, um, birth, this whole madness. So that's, that's how it all started. Really just kind of like BSing in my kitchen and, and talking and the yeah. next thing you know, here we are. All right, so our fifth one, and might be, it's up there with what was this building? Will you work on my insert car or project here? Uh, there's a misconception that this is like a fully functioning, like for-profit hot rod shop. It's this a is, hot rod shop, it's just. For loss. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say format hot no, rod shop. It's for loss, it's basically you guys get to watch me turn my life into financial ruin <laughs> over a slow process. <laughs> <laughs> and become a hoarder yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah so this is not a hot rod shop I we, we don't do customer work um, I did have a roadster on the table um, that I was helping a guy out doing some rust repair I basically told him no for like a year that I wouldn't work on his car and he caught me at like a weak moment where I was probably trying to buy a car and needed some money and I said yes and he brought the car over I told him I would work on it whenever I got around to it and it turned into like two years that it sat here uh, Aaron was very, very understanding and allow, allowed me to be my usual self. Usual self, but uh, eventually I did get it done. But it was like it was really. I just know myself, and I get distracted easily. And no. if it's no. not, yeah, <laughs> if it's no. not, if it's not my car, I, I for whatever reason, even though I, you know, even if it is your car, you get easily distracted. Yeah. Don't lie. But like I don't get, I'm not as interested. Yeah, I'm working on somebody else's car for whatever reason, and and um, so. I just don't get enjoyment out of it. So what I've tried to do with my, my ho the hobby and the shop and everything we do is I try to do the buying and selling of parts and stuff like that to supplement the money instead of doing side work. I learned from my dad and, and, and different people around me in my life that were doing mechanical work and side work uh, in their free time. And it's like, if all you do is work on other people's cars to make money, to hopefully work on your own car, you end up not working on your own car. So like, I found that I can buy and sell stuff, have what I want, and you know, if I get bored, it's really just because I have too many projects, not because I don't want to work on somebody's car. So I don't want to do work on your car. I'm really sorry. I don't care how much money you have. I've turned down people that want to like, have us build a full car from start to finish and you know, offer us really good money. But all it's going to do is give me a bad reputation for being a, uh, a slacker and a uh, bit of an a-hole. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just don't want to do that. I have no interest in doing that. Uh, we have no plans to do that. And but what you can do is if you catch Matt on a good day, there's a project here, you may be able to buy it because that's happened a few times. Yeah. We've had a couple of people that came by and had a project that I was kind of like bored with or whatever. And like they talked some sense into me and were able to buy it. But, um, Really, yes, we do buy and sell parts to make money, and sometimes people give us flack for that, but really, I mean, it's no different than you going to Walmart and buying an item that was, you know, a big corporation's buying for pennies and selling to you for more. We're doing the same stuff, doing the work, digging it out and, and reselling it, but I, I think that brings me more satisfaction than doing work for other people. And there is a ton of great shops that do fantastic work that's way above my amateur level that I am happy to, uh, to uh, tell you guys about. So people send us messages. Usually I'm giving references to friends that have shops all around the country that will do f fantastic work and will be timely or at least be straight shooters and will push your car in the corner and buy 17 cars instead of working on your car, which that's probably great. an accurate number. Very close 17 to 17 cars, 17 cars. But so yeah, that's, that's kind of the answer to that. And it's always a difficult conversation to have with people, but um, I think just handling it that way has been the best. And um, unless something crazy happens where we have a whole staff, I don't think that'll ever happen. And we don't even have any room for customer cars because I fill every square inch up with all my stupid purchases. So. 
That is our top five questions asked about Iron Trap Garage. So if you guys have a question or have a request for a video kind of like this, these are kind of fun. We've been talking about doing an updated tour video of the shop. We did one of those like the first year, I think we had. Yeah, we had like 500 subscribers and I think we did one of those videos. Yeah, so we did a two part video of walking around the shop, talking about all the signs, all that stuff. So if you guys think videos like that would be interesting, they help us uh, supplement the three videos a week. And if it gives you guys some background and it's interesting, we'd love to do more of these. So thank you guys for watching. Appreciate all the support and all the questions and comments. Thanks guys. Enjoy.